He will be on Facebook live. Oh, I'm on Facebook again. So on the call. Okay. Now that was there before also. Yeah. Other Aaron, you could do the MICC for the Max page. Aaron, you could do the countdown. Sure. So um, uh, just doctor, let me know when you guys are ready. Doctor, Doctor Bera, could you go to your first slide so that uh, we can see that instead? Doctor Bera, sir. Ah, uh, yeah. So, you take the first slide. Will take it. Yes, sir. Second. Yes. Somebody called Doctor uh, Surya Khan to say that we are going on live. I'll just call him. सर 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 आ गए हैं हैं डॉक्टर डॉक्टर सूर्यकांत सूर्यकांत इसको मैं बंद अभी गुड इवनिंग डॉक्टर सूर्यकांत हाँ सर आप बंद कर लीजिए हाय गुड इवनिंग Good evening very good evening to all of you good evening sir very good evening sir good evening dr sundakant yeah good evening kaise hain sir bilkul badhiya sir bilkul badhiya hum apne ko lakhnow mein feel kar rahe hain good evening sir very good evening okay uh, our we have login should we go live sir then I think Facebook uh, team is waiting. Yes, Dr. Surikant, Dr. Navin Kishore, pulmonologist. Hi, Navin. Yes, yes. I, I, How are you? How are you? Good yes, to see you. Good to see you. Yeah. Same here. Good. Good. Ah, yes. Okay. Are we ready to go, uh, Dr. Surikant? Can we start? Yes, we can. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, Yeah, so um, we'll be going day. live in twenty seconds. Okay. Sure. Sure. All right. Going live in five, four, three, two. We're live. Good evening, Doctor Surikant. Could you take over the stage, please? Ah, uh, sure, sure, sure. G. So, should I start? Yes, sir. Please, sir. Please. I think Dr. Harit will uh, so give some uh, introductory comments, and then I'll take over. Okay. Then I'll take over. Yeah. So, thank you, Dr. Surit, Professor Surikant, and the team of Palnology at KGMU and Lucknow Society. for having us with us uh, with you here this evening and we are looking forward to this engagement in a more productive way because we are looking at how the landscape of oncology is changing rapidly and more and more we integrate the better will be the outcome for these patients and uh, with this i want to start this exchange for this evening we'll in the one hour or so we'll go through the presentations and case discussion to make it more interactive and we'll take questions from the audience and from there we'll start so dr surikant will you okay so from i'll just introduce the faculty from our side and then we we'll... can is there some echo yeah yeah sure yeah sure so uh thank you dr harit uh, for uh, organizing this wonderful evening academic evening i would say especially focused on the lung cancer and as you rightly mentioned that uh, in last three decades the whole scenario of approach to lung cancer and even the stakeholders of lung cancer management this has changed and of course the credit in this country goes to more and more involvement of more and more chest physician in the early diagnosis of lung cancer because 
you know the symptoms of lung cancer Absolutely. they are mimicking with the very common disease in this country that is pulmonary tuberculosis so it is very difficult to differentiate in early stages whether this is the case of pulmonary tuberculosis or lung cancer and of course uh, the the uh, fraternity and the patient and of course the general physicians they are of course not having too much skill regarding the sensitization of early diagnosis of lung cancer and that side they are lined up uh, usually misdiagnosed as pulmonary tuberculosis so this is the pleasant duty of chest physician in this country and i think you have rightly chosen us department of respiratory medicine king george medical university for involving in this program organized basically by you from the max hospital uh, the uh, cancer institute management so uh, of course credit goes to you and your team and i really want to congratulate you people and in this country if you see the sensitization of our chest fraternity for lung cancer done mainly by dr digambar behra so he is pioneer he is mentor and he is the i'm uh, the force behind us who has developed who has sensitized who has taken a lead for the diagnosis and management of lung cancer especially uh, popularizing this specialty among the chest physician before that before when i was the resident i'm talking of 1991 and 92 93 so in that area you see mostly our our job was to diagnose tuberculosis and some respiratory other respiratory diseases and if comes to be lung cancer then of course we used to refer to the i mean uh, hardly there was any surgeon who is operating for this cancer surgery and hardly there is any medical oncologist for malignant so the the other was a very gray area and very desperate area i would say then of course the uh, of course uh, the time came when dr behra took took the lead and i would mention whenever the dr behra was he was, i remember the uh, the institute in delhi if you remember the very well known sciences now it is termed as national institute of uh, respiratory diseases nitrd national institute of tb and respiratory diseases and credit of this institute converting its image from tuberculosis institute to complete respiratory disease definitely goes to dr digambar behra because when he became the director of that institute he started the lung cancer diagnosis and treatment there before that there was no sensitization for the diagnosis and treatment of lung cancer i still remember my one of the student uh, dr saini is there uh, who was perfectly trained by dr behra and now he is taking care of all the patients of lung cancer coming to that institute so that was a wonderful thing and later on our institute uh, of course the uh, before that only hope was the uh, i'm talking of 30 years back the hope was the tata institute of uh, tata cancer institute at mumbai i mean somebody is having lung cancer the only hope was there and now i am really happy still i am uh, i really really want to congratulate you that only a few surgeons in this country they are involved in the surgery of lung tumors and lung cancers but now this specialty is coming up now we have started in dnb uh, thoracic surgery also a few people like you dr arvind kumar and so many people they started this dnb course uh, of course we are also trying hard to develop we have developed a pulmonary surgery unit in the king george medical university and now personally i am trying hard to uh, provide the all facilities under one roof as a institute of pulmonary sciences we have submitted the uh, proposal to the uh, university and probably uh, very soon we will have the pulmonary surgery pulmonary diseases diagnostic and so many other things under one roof so that's a good thing now i uh, don't think that dr digambar behra need any introduction dr digambar behra has been a very pioneer in the field of so many respiratory diseases he is also workforce he is also man behind the tuberculosis control program in this country so it is wonderful that he is looking after both major diseases the tuberculosis and lung cancer as a pioneer uh, person in this country he is the uh, uh, founder president of indian society for the study of lung cancer and i'm fortunate enough that last conference i organized in king george medical university as a organizing uh, secretary on 15th and uh, 16th december 
before this uh, this corona came probably this was the last national conference which was organized in 2019 december and later on the now conferences has become physical conferences has become a dream now only virtual conferences virtual meetings are going on like this so i welcome uh, dr digambar behra after taking retirement as he is the recipient of two national awards the uh, bc roy award and the padam shri award so he has been uh, extended his services for two years in uh, pgi chandigarh so really we are proud of dr digambar behra uh, that he is the bc roy award is same and two times bc roy award not one time two time bc roy award padam shri award and so many other, other awards i cannot enumerate in this short interval of time so i now i invite dr digambar behra to give his powerpoint presentation on indian scenario of lung cancer and overview dr digambar behra please uh, share your ppt uh, to the screen so thank you professor suryakant and i am uh, and good evening everybody now what is happening why it is not getting projected am i is it is it visible yes sir okay so thank you thank you uh it is not showing here the full projection i don't know yes why. sir visible very much visible you are very visible very much visible. but why it is not uh, there is no full screen is not showing here yes Okay, so maybe no more. Oh, but I better press F5. Press F5. F5, yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Sir. Okay. So again, uh, good, very good evening to everybody, and I am thankful to, uh, you know, the Max team as well as the KGMU, with the initiative of Professor Surya Kant and uh, Dr. Chaturvedi for this uh, session today. Uh, Uh, as you know i'll just uh, give you a brief overview of lung cancer in india uh, you all know the audience know very well that lung cancer is now the commonest uh, cancer in the world also it is the number one cause of death because of uh, any cancer in the world today particularly in the male when you come to india you know the i could only lay my hands in one of the publication earliest publication in 1935 by nath and grewal where they have just mentioned about uh, the issue of lung cancer then subsequently in the late 40s and then the early 50s it is a late dr bishwanathan who for the first time present a, a series of uh, about 65 cases of lung cancer and then as you can see subsequently i have just summarized for you the various case series they came up from different parts of the country almost all parts of the country and one of the latest series has come from the all india institute of medical sciences which uh, are nearly 2000 photo is not proper some technical problem is there which one am i not audible audible sir audible then what is the problem somebody told okay so you know this is just to tell you about the estimated number of lung cancers in the world and the india that is what is projected or was projected for 2020 for just i like to draw your attention yeah, that while in a, this is the comparison between 2012 and 2020 you see in india we are expecting in both success and increase of about 25 to 26% of cases of lung cancer as was being seen in the 2012 the same thing in the world so what uh, actually i am trying to convey is that the lung cancer is going to increase in the future and as regards as of today you know lung cancer 
is the next uh, to oral and oropharyngeal cancer it is the second most common cancer in case of males and of course in females it is one of the first 10 common cancer in india today as regards the interest about the pubmed publications on lung cancer from india i can see the interest of uh, both the pulmonologist and the oncologist whether he is a surgeon or he is a medical oncologist and others you can see the interest has grown over the years and it is growing two or three important points i will again like to draw your kind attention you see this was one of the reviews i had made in 2004 about the lung cancer issues you see the this was the first one that shows the lung cancer different types of lung cancer that was before or you know between 56 to 85 the adenocarcinoma used to be around 15% but the most common cancer was the common cell cancer and then the publications between 86 to 2001 you can see squamous cell carcinoma was still the commonest cancer but you know the adenocarcinoma was rising you can see that is the one thing again as i so told you the squamous cell was still the commonest cancer then actually over the years over the next 10 15 years what we saw we saw interestingly a change you see the adenocarcinoma is gradually taking over the squamous cell carcinoma the particularly in some areas like south west and then i'll try to show you what is happening in the north this is one of our own publications between 2011 and 2015 the squamous cell carcinoma was the commonest cancer but again you see this series which we published in 2017 you see this has taken over this was almost the same as that of this squamous cell cancer that is about 36% of all the lung cancer this is again the largest series which is about nearly 2000 cases from all india institute you see adenocarcinoma was the commonest cancer in their series more interestingly if you see the if you this is a year wise presentation in the earlier years 2008 9 10 then somewhere in 2012 13 in the incident of adenocarcinoma started rising and then now the presently so it is about 35 36% of their cases and simultaneously this commercial percentage obviously one percentage has to come down i think the besides there are many causes why adenocarcinoma is leading even in this country i think one of the most important things as i believe is the earlier days when we did not have the immuno histochemistry it was only just the histopathology training and the reporting and most of the cases many cases in fact were reported as nos or did not otherwise specify so i think this improvement occurred because of better help from the our pathology clinic uh, clinic uh, pathologists uh, uh, our pathology uh, colleagues again another the second important thing to note is the the stage of the disease by the time the present this is a, again one of the uh, you know the summary of uh, dr navneet singh again you can see the the most of our cases they present quite uh, in advanced stage stage 3 or stage 4 of the disease this is again the all india series which again says you can see the stage 3 and stage 4 and hardly the early stage so called early stage stage 1 and 2 it was uh, very less you can see less than 5% was in stage 1 and stage 2 similarly in the small cell extensive stage again was uh, more commonly seen in our country and then coming to the various diagnostic methods that are available over the years i can just uh, tell you the, the 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 pulmonologist which they use the various ways of diagnosing fortunately most of those uh, diagnostic methods are now available and the our pulmonologist and then the oncologist who are uh, interested in treating lung cancer the these types of uh, diagnostic facilities are available in the country then this slide again i need not tell the you the you are all uh, oncologist so you know the lung cancer is a, not the single disease in any, in the early 90s we are telling it is lung cancer then came non small cell small cell then came adeno large squamous small cell and then actually now obviously nobody will accept this one now 
we are talking of whether he is EGF or positive, he is ALK positive, he is ROS1 positive, MET positive like this. And then one going one step further, I think nowadays again, you need to tell what is the PDL1 level, whether it is PDL1 more than 50, more than 1, 20%, 25%, like this. So that is how the transition we are seeing now. Now just coming to the genomic characteristics again, the newer developments, we know we have got uh, the genomic uh, characterization, this is of this common cell carcinoma, but unfortunately not uh, many drugs are not in fact any drug which is used clinically is available for this. But I think in adenocarcinoma, there are a lot of uh, things have developed. This is a, you know, it is 25 genes which are been uh, identified, not the genes of the mutations in different areas. You see, these are the molecular characterization by the NGS, uh, newer generation uh, gene sequencing. You can see, remember not, Every one of them is targetable. Now we have got uh, some targetable mutations that uh, they are available. Then another interesting thing is the EGFR mutations in non-small cell lung cancer. As you can see, there is a wide variation world uh, over. Some countries it is very high, some countries it is less. So again, I am not going into that detail. We have got a talk. I will just uh, present two or three publications from this country. This is the data from the Tata memorial nearly 1000 cases you know the they have reported an overall of about 23 percent of their adenocarcinoma will have uh, egfr positivity actually that is the center they also test the squamous cell cancer they about uh, 3.8 percent of their squamous cell cancers are also egfr positive and again they have tried to say that uh, when there is a egfr mutation is positive and then the treatment response is better and you'll hear much uh, uh, more detail about that. This is our own data from PGI. You can see this about 1150 patients between this period. So overall what we saw about our EGFR positive rate is about 26% and this one it is the ALK one that is uh, uh, and same thing about the All India Institute that is again they saw about 25% of their cases are EGFR positive. So it is very important to understand, I think the all our pulmonary uh, uh, colleagues, they all know now that they know about the tissue is the issue because apart from the histopathological diagnosis, we need to have a molecular diagnosis. So, so therefore what we have understood that lung cancer is not a single disease. It is a collection of distinct molecular driver uh, driven neoplasms. And then, then subsequently the discovery of amino therapy or immuno-oncology has changed this concept, this uh, uh, entire concept of lung cancer. You know, this is just, I have summarized for you the various ways how we treat lung cancer. It be, whether it is a, you know, surgery in early stages, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, targeted therapy, immunotherapy, or the best supportive care. That, in, fortunately, I think in India, we have got everything is available now, but earlier days, there are difficulties. And then now, I think the the, these things are always available. And I was talking about the driver mutations and amplifications, EGFR, I have already talked to you. And then coming to the ALK inhibitors, we have got uh, these drugs. And most of these drugs are again easily available in this country. And these are the, uh, the published reports about the ALK positivity in various series from this country only I'm showing. The, it varies, you know, between 2.5%. 7% uh, to as high as 11.5%, but again, roughly about 7 to 8% of adenocarcinomas will be ALK positive. And then the chrysotinib, again, this is a, uh, this is a uh, real world experience in India. This is a publication, so with use of uh, chrysotinib in ALK positive lung cancer, you can see the median progression free survival for the day around 11 months and the median overall survival for the entire cohort is about 34 months, which are, these are the type of things we had never seen earlier. Similarly, ROS1 prevalence in India, there are different studies. It is not uh, very high, so around less than two to 3% will have ROS1 positive. And then again, this slide summarizes the treatment of various things. There is mutation, EGFR mutation, MET, ROS, RET, ALK, and all these things there, available and then again I am not going into the details because 
will hear that subsequently then coming to immunology of cancer as we know that one hallmark of cancer is immuno evasion that is the the t cells they cannot attack cancer and this is basically the the interplay of uh, pd1 and the pdl1 the program death uh, ligand and the program pd1 and the pdl1 so then there are various drugs you know there is a, there are lot of drugs we'll hear the lecture in detail but what i am just trying to draw your kind of attention these things are also possible in this country so we can now estimate the pdl1 level and these are the immunotherapy treatment algorithm that has changed and fortunately these treatment modalities are also available and then many oncologists and even those who are not oncologists they are using this type of algorithm whether the pdl1 depending upon the pdl1 level and then the another important thing why i try to tell you how things have changed you know this is the this is a overall picture the world uh, over the overall picture is this is the pdl1 expression in about you see 25% 20 to 25% of cases of uh, a case of lung cancer they will have expression of pdl1 more than 50% and then about 50% will be more than 1% and again a less than a uh, 1% expression will be in about 50, that means 50% of the cases can be you know given this type of uh, immunotherapy and immunotherapy of lung cancer again some publications from this country with many of uh, uh, the people in different centers they are using now the immunotherapy uh, and then again this is a, another summary of uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors and then you can see non smell lung cancer is also being treated that is calm so then you see one of the things which is just at the end i can tell you the scope of personalized therapy of uh, uh, for the uh, for the uh, chemotherapy uh, uh, for the i mean the immunotherapy or the targeted therapy if you see what i say about 40% of our lung cancer about out of 100 cases of lung cancer about 40% are adenocarcinoma and of that if you calculate the egfr all and the rare mutations like ras met braf etc so that means around 32 to 35% of these 40 cases that means out of those 100 cases about 15 cases will be will be giving some sort of targetable therapy or then if you are seeing the expression of pd wall expression then many more patients can be given either immunotherapy or you know one of those targeted therapy so that is what is the change that has occurred but however one of the important issues we must always remember in this country that about the cost the availability the 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 uh, the when you are using any trial then the participation in trial the financial generic drug and then aggressive approach so these are some of the issues we have to take into time i'll just take two more slides you know this is the journey when you can see many of the youngsters they like to see that is as a pulmonologist we started uh, our journey in 84 lung cancer you see that obviously this is the well known we try to see first whether the survival is better with or without chemotherapy so some sort of chemotherapy was given if you see this is the summary in 17 and 80 we are just giving these are the very drugs now many of the oncologists will start laughing ventristin methotrexate cyclophosphamide then newer and newer drugs came and then now we are in the era of immunotherapy i you know at that time when no chemotherapy was given it was only just few weeks then as with single agent and then the less effective chemo with modern chemotherapy and then again as we go on the survival has gone as you can see this is the example of egfr about 113 percent which are egfr you can see the overall survival in days it is about 727 days or it is more than two years you can see which had never was heard of similarly the alk outcome you can see about uh, nearly 60% of cases will be surviving for one year and then the another 34% about two years and so on so these are uh, ladies and gentlemen these are the changes this is what uh, has happened even in this country it was possible you see when there are five weeks seven weeks and now you can talk of in year but actually what is the problem this is a real world practice we have many times the 
the testing is not done by everybody even if the testing is done because of various reasons the cost and other issues even the molecular testing is done not many patients receive this treatment and then regarding the as we know so our best target approach is the smoking in this country we know the tobacco use in india is the very common very large population using tobacco so our focus should be on that is the tobacco prevention lung cancer screening i'll just in one word is not a possibility in this country at this juncture because of various uh, reasons so in summary i can tell you india is experiencing a rising burden from lung cancer then the we take time the geographic or variability so our strategy should be stopping smoking the smoking cessation then i think one of the important things which dr suryakant said differentiating tb from lung cancer is an important issue on clinical and radiological grounds then the treatment decision in context of our socio economic and the geographic constraints they have to be based upon both biological and logistic factors and then of course with the availability of uh, scope of the oral drug and of course immunotherapy which as present is very costly so the challenges are delay in diagnosis then the treatment issues so it is this ladies and gentlemen the i'll just uh, end here telling that we have to take a balance about the survival quality cost availability and then we should uh, tackle the case of lung cancer in this country thank you very much i'll stop here thank you thank you thank you, thank you very dr behra it was really a masterly presentation by dr behra uh, thank you very much i think within uh, this short time only dr behra can present the lung cancer from a to z i completely so agree dr nitesh radhi for the uh, further uh, proceedings mm -hmm. no i i really must congratulate dr behra we we very seldom hear such a fantastic capsule in such a short period i completely agree with you i think i'm a bit spell bounded and a bit quiet on that note thank you very much dr behra i'll hand over to dr harit uh, to briefly introduce our, our our department and welcome you all uh, when maybe uh, you can come in person and then we will take, go over to some cases which are founded on everything dr behra just discussed dr harit i think dr behra starting of a lung mm. cancer clinic at pgi in 1984 shows the leadership and foresight of a pulmonologist at how the challenge is growing and he could see all that and really as nitesh said such a comprehensive coverage from 70s 80s to what is modern oncology practice and such a short time is really amazing very inspiring sir you are really amazed and you have you have been an influence on so many lives i know that so with that i want to briefly introduce the max oncology team so we started this department in 2009 and with lot of uh, we we were a group of people and today we are almost 100 oncologists working together under one umbrella of max institute of cancer care what we have done very successfully and probably one of the very few departments which is in a private sector we have made disease management groups the lung cancer team is focusing on lung cancer the breast team is focusing on breast cancer the head and neck team is focusing on head and neck cancer and that goes across specialties the surgical medical radiation oncologists are divided on those departmental lines and that is how we have grown grow, uh, grown this team and this does goes on to radiology and pathology also so this is the structure which we have followed in building the department and as professor surikant highlighted in the beginning that for example we do not have many focus teams in lung cancer even surgeons are not so many in pulmonology the way knowledge has expanded in last 30 years we have seen almost uh, 400 plus drugs coming just into last uh, a decade or so into various aspects so to gather all that knowledge and to apply that in day to day practice is really not easy dr behra pointed out that even though the knowledge is there the testing is low and when testing is done the application is low all this is really the challenge of absorbing that working in an integrated way and delivering that so we have been trying to build that comprehensiveness in the program that seamless continuity the folk program focuses on prevention to palliation we have got a tobacco cessation clinic to palliative care clinic everything is part of the oncology program so this is what we want to show that this is where we are and one practice which we are very proud to show that we practice classical tumor board practice we come from different organizations nitesh has 
full, almost fully trained in UK. Devrath is trained in GCRI and uh, Delhi. I got trained in Adyar, Chennai. Shubham Jain on the screen is from Tata Memorial. And so all of us bring different experiences and practices. And when we work together, we bring all that knowledge and that culture. And what has happened, that in, in pre-COVID times, we were discussing all cases in real time. Today, still on Zoom, just as we are having this meeting, every case discuss, discussed on Zoom. And that process is followed consistently. So this is our uh, structure. What we, have, we are showing on the right side of the screen is the poster which is displayed in our OPD. And similar thing you'll see on our website also, how we have structured the department and we showcase that publicly want to position it, that this is how future of oncology will grow and this is what we want to build. Now to talk about thoracic DMG, the two medical oncology champions are Dr. Nitesh and Dr. Devrat. They are both uh, focusing on lung and breast also. And so we are in the growing phase. Few people have more than one DMG, but generally not more than two and maximum few people have got three, but we are avoiding that as much as we can. And as we grow, number of people grows, that happens consistently. From surgical side, me and Shubham Jain, we work on lung cancers and esophagus, and we focus on that. And Charu is our addition oncologist who again focuses on breast and thoracic DMG. Dr. Naveen Kishore is running the pulmonology department, which is almost an integral part of the oncology service. I would say, Naveen, with due apologies, that for all lung cancer, we all work together very closely. And as we all know, without a good pulmonology team to back and navigate through the journey of a lung cancer patient, whether it is staging, whether it is follow-up, or uh, care when infections happen, things like that is not possible. So we have got a fantastic backup and integrated team, and we work together very closely. So with that, I want to hand over to Nitesh to take us through uh, the uh, discussion on the case. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Harith. And, and um, I think I'll go straight to some cases and what we do here. Um, uh, starting off with a case that recently came to our center, which was stage three. Mr. V was an ex-smoker to three years ago, had two stents and no other ailments. He had a two-month history of cough and had hemoptysis, a fair amount of hemoptysis, which led him to certain scans. And then finally, a PET CT. Uh, in fact, he was biopsied outside, but the biopsy was actually from within the necrotic center, so it was negative. So he actually came to us saying the biopsy is negative, but I've been told I have cancer. Yeah. And we did a PET, which showed uh, this the images initially. And, the and then we saw this on the mediastinal nodes on the PET. Uh, and typically what we do, and I think as most of you, as, as Dr. Surya Kant also said, most of these patients end up with a pulmonologist first. So I'll hand over to Navin to talk about how do we go from staging, and, and we are changing it from stage one to stage four, to actually stage from four to stage one, completely in keeping with Dr. Behra was suggesting that this is mostly an advanced disease. Uh, over to you, Navin. Right. Uh, thanks, uh, Nitesh, for that. And uh, yes, so as Nitesh said, what we would do is we we try and uh, figure out whether the, the cancer is spread when we diagnose it. In this case, a diagnosis was made by a CT biopsy. We would then do a PET CT. If we get a peripheral met somewhere, either in the brain or in the bones, we would biopsy that to see whether it's a straightaway or stage four. If that's negative, we would move to look for pleural disease. If there is a pleural effusion, we would either do a pleural uh, biopsy with a pleuroscopy or um, a cell block uh, of the pleural fluid. Um, and if the cytology is positive or the cell block is positive or the biopsy is positive, obviously it moves up stage to stage three. And if that is negative, then we would do an EBUS to look at the contralateral mediastinal lymph nodes. If they're positive, it goes up to uh, stage 2B. So the point here is we go from stage four, from peripheral METs to stage three, pleural METs to stage to, uh, depending on where the nodes are, we would EBUS it. Sometimes a PET would pick up a, a positive node contralaterally and an EBUS would confirm that it is a granulomatous node or a non-malignant node. Uh, and so we would then be able to downstage it from a radiological perspective, we would downstage it with an EBUS. So we try and then give our oncology team the best possible uh, roadmap to be able to then decide whether they can go ahead uh, for surgery or uh, or how to go about treating the case. Nitesh. I'm just uh, putting a slide on uh, of how you do a video of EBUS. 
uh, if you can yes. run through that too. Yeah. One second. So that's an E bus, as we know, it's an uh, it's an ultrasound on the tip of the bronchoscope, and there you can see the needle in the lymph node. We can delineate lymph nodes. We use Doppler to be able to differentiate lymph nodes from blood vessels. And we have something called ROSE, which is rapid on-site evaluation, where we can uh, tell in real time, our pathologists see the slide, cytopathologists see the slide and tell us whether it's malignant or not. They first tell us whether it's representative or not. And if it's representative, whether it's malignant or not. And if it is malignant and we want to take a cell block, we can do it there and then. And if it is not malignant and if it's a granuloma, we put the sample into cultures for AFB and gene expert. So we have real time evaluation of our slide and, and we do EBUS. Uh, that's just last week, uh, one of the cases that we did. So that's how we go about uh, staging excellent. lung cancer. That, that's really excellent. And I think that has really changed the way we have practiced lung cancer in the last two years. Both the EBUS and the real time ROSE testing has, has really made big difference. Of course, for the patient, the fact that they're now waiting uh, a week to understand what to do next has made big differences as well. But but needless to say, the mediastinal staging of a not stage four tumor is very critical. And and while EBUS is very important in this, I think I think it's possibly the most important thing that has happened. The role of mediastinoscopy has not died out. So I'll hand over to Shubham to talk about both the advantages where must and actually where there's a contraindication as well. Shubham. Thanks, Dr. Nitesh. Uh, it's actually an honor to be sharing screen with Dr. Behera and speaking on this topic because there is a review and meta-analysis by Dr. Behera's team from PGH Chandigarh that came out recently comparing both the EBUS and the mediastinoscopy and highlighting the importance of mediastinal staging. Uh, so I'll be speaking on the mediastinal staging. Uh, so this is an algorithm which uh, the thoracic societies globally follow. They do place EBUS or the endoscopic bronchial ultrasound as the primary modality to stage the mediastinum to know whether the nodes are involved or not. But then there are certain cases where we still, though the EBUS has come as negative, we clinically suspect the lymph nodes to be involved. For example, in the case that you had shown of uh, Mr. V, uh, that we were discussing only last week. There were some stated on the pet, but they were not accessible to EBUS. So for those uh, nodes especially, the surgical role for staging the mediastinum comes into play. So the mediastinum needs to be staged primarily for all the central tumors, peripheral tumors if they're more than three centimeters in size, uh, with uh, any uh, region with the low FDG uptake in the primary tumor or any other features which make the node suspicious. So these are the patients who definitely need to be staged uh, for mediastinal involvement, EBUS being the primary modality. But if it is not possible through EBUS, then the role of a surgeon comes in, where we try to do it either with a cervical mediastinoscopy through an uh, approach through the neck or through a wax, uh, which is an approach through the chest. So can I have the next slide? So these are some of the representative images that I have taken from one of the uh, cervical mediastinoscopies that I was doing. So over here in the images, you can see the subcarinal and the uh, lower paratracheal nodes on the left side. In this image, we can see both before dissection and after dissection, how the lymph nodes start appearing. And then we've been able to biopsy this. And after the biopsy is done, we just pack it up and we send these nodes for a full section. And it helps us to know whether the patient would benefit out of the surgery that we would be performing on the patient or not. So as I said, the role of the surgical mediastinoscopy, it's not replacing EBUS. It is just complementary to the EBUS, wherein we may need the tissue for uh, more tissue for better pathological characterization. As Dr. Behra said, tissue is many times the issue. Uh, it could be indicated for clinically high suspicious uh, mediastinal nodes, despite an EBUS being negative. Or it could also be extended as a therapeutic modality for smaller mediastinal lesions. So, Coming next, I'd like to present a sample case that we had come across of a 60-year-old gentleman, a smoker and suspected to have an advanced lung cancer with extensive mediastinal lymphadenopathy. The EBUS report, though it confirmed a poorly differentiated malignant tumor, was not able to have further because of the lack of tissue. We were not able to perform any IHC. So we found the patient to be feasible for a cervical mediastinoscopy. And uh, the next picture shows the amount of tissue that we were actually able to retrieve from the mediastinal lymph nodes. So there was enough tissue for any further IHC to be done. And the IHC actually came as a surprise for this patient, wherein it called it a diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. 
so it turned the management head over heels and that is how the uh, you know, importance of tissue is there of uh, how pathology pathologists can actually change the diagnosis from one to another so just to summarize uh, and obviously the procedure is contraindicated if the patient is having cervical arthritis or there is a percutaneous tracheostomy or in very small patients such as infants and small children so uh, that's it thank you thank you very much uh, shubham that as i say is possibly the fastest capsule of mediastinoscopy and so succinct and clear thank you for that uh, this was meant to be a debate but we're not doing that today it it, it is uh, but we'll hand over to dr charu gar who heads our radiation side on thoracic oncology and she'll be discussing the role of sbrt in early lung cancer and stun you with that thank you thank you nitesh ready so uh, basically i'm going to talk about sbrt which is which stands for stereotactic body radiotherapy or known as stereotactic ablative radiotherapy so uh, why do we want this so we all know like dr bera also said the median age of lung cancer diagnosis is 70 years and if you see 53 of the percent of the patients would fall between 55 to 74 year old age group while one third would be over 75 and this proportion the one over 75 is going to increase in the future in the aging population and uh, probably because of the option of the ct screen or you see the real world data in clinical stage 1 so the blue one if you see that is the uh, surgery and you can see that there is a dip beyond the age of 70 and the red uh, uh, line graph is of sbrt and above that age if you see all uh, all across the globe it is on a increasing trend so why basically we understand that these patients uh, stage 1 patients are for surgery but uh, there are a certain set of patients who are inoperable as of now and we are having a lot of uh, phase 3 randomized trial to compare between uh, operable and inoperable cancers to be taken up for sbrt so all these cases are discussed in our uh, uh, disease management group all the multidisciplinary team meeting and if you see in this uh, systematic review of the literature which came out in january 2016 which analyzed 27 articles the impact of these mdts so they said that between 4 and 45% of the patients discussed experience changes in the diagnostic reports following the mdts and patients who were discussed in these meetings they were likely to receive more accurate and complete preoperative staging and the adjuvant and the new adjuvant treatments and mind it a few of these articles even showed a benefit in survival but not all of them next slide so we also know like similarly what is there in surgery we know that if you if a patient is operated in a high uh, volume center the outcomes are much better similarly even in radiation especially for these uh, highly specialized techniques if it is done in a high volume center there is a statistically significant benefit in survival next so i'll just uh, uh, i'll uh, tell you the potential benefits over surgery first of all this is a non invasive procedure and it is an opd procedure and then it is very safe in elderly next so we can even do it in uh, patients who have got uh, copd or other comorbidities especially what you would expect at this age and this is a new thing which is coming up uh, potential immunologic effect where a lot of time we give very high dose rate and you know then your immunotherapy it serves better then at times uh, we don't we, we cannot even do a tissue diagnosis because of the comorbidities of the patient so if it is a radiological diagnosis we can even go ahead and do radi- uh, sbrt without it it has got a uh, improved patient convenience and uh, there is reduced morbidity and mortality and it can be done easily after the thoracic treatments as well so this is a case of a 73 year old female who had no com- comorbidities and you can see a very well uh, uh, a very well delineated lesion in the left upper lobe and she refused for surgery so here we next slide so here we place a vesicoil marker you can see our interventional radiologist placing that marker in the tumor or near the tumor and once it is inserted after 5 days we take a ct scan and then we uh, contour this uh, target give a ptv margin and in this since it was a small lesion we were able to give a dose of 54 grain three fractions so three fractions means just three days that means the treatment is over within a week for a ca lung 
and you can appreciate the uh, lesion at four months and at nine months, and there is a complete disappearance of this lesion at nine months. So uh, just to show you, this is a, a slide showing where on the extreme left, you can see the red one is the tumor. And uh, if we have to treat this, we have to give really large margins to cover it, what we are writing as ITV-based margins. So we'll end up, the blue one is, you know, you'll end up treating that large part of lung. Now, real-time tracking-based treatments are our cyber knife where the beam would move with a moving target. Or we can do it on a gating-based treatment. That means the beam will be switched on only when the uh, gross tumor, the tumor would move into our area of the planning target body. So this is how these high-end treatments, they end up irradiating a very small portion of lung and we can give very high ablative doses. Next slide. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Aru. I think what we have done so far is giving you a very brief, as you noticed, just a very short brief of how we approach the whole thing, whether it's staging, whether it's mediastinoscopy, or whether it is SBRT for patients who are not fit for surgery. Uh, uh, but I'll hand over to Devrat Adia. Dr. Bera did discuss this and, and he showed how a huge number of patients may be fit for immunotherapy. It's making huge news. But really the question is, is why is the world going crazy about immunotherapy? And, and while Dr. Bera spoke about statistics, I'll hand over to Devrat to present a case and show real time how it, is of use and how, how it's of benefit. Devrat? Yeah. <clears throat> good evening, uh, Nitesh, and uh, good evening, everyone. And uh, I think it was 2015 when we had the first phase three randomized trial in lung cancer for immunomonotherapy being reported. That was in second line. I think since then, uh, the indications have increased and, and our excitement has grown. And uh, I think we are, to some extent, going crazy. I think we as a center has one of the largest experience of immunotherapy. Nitesh has a lot of patients. I have a lot of patients on immunotherapy where we've been able to replicate some of the excellent results that have been reported from the West. Next slide. So I'll uh, start with the case. So this was, this was an elderly female. She was a 76-year-old female who had a history of cough for the previous few months. There's no hemoptysis. Not surprisingly for Indian female, she's was, she was a non-smoker. And uh, I had to uh, commend the, uh, the chest specialist that uh, she'd gone to. The workup was very quick. An FNEC was done, which was suggested for non-small cell lung cancer. And a PET scan was also performed very quickly, which revealed a, a 4.5 centimeter mass lesion in the left upper lobe. But unfortunately, in addition to that, multiple pulmonary and bone mets as well. And, and, and the patient was very quickly referred to us, to our hospital. Next slide. And whenever we see, uh, Nitesh would agree that whenever we see an Asian non-smoker female, we start getting excited because this is the clinical subset that may harbor one of the driver mutations that Dr. Behra was earlier alluding to. Uh, so we did a biopsy. Uh, we wanted to know the histology. It was adenocarcinoma. We did a testing for EGFR, ALK, ROS1, and PDL1, as has been our paradigm. And, and for a significant number of patients, we are actually now doing a next generation sequencing, I think. Nitesh will talk about that a little bit in his own talk. Unfortunately, there's no activating mutation, but the PDL one did come out as high, being 80%. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, a few years ago, this patient would have had the old standard of care that would have been a platinum-based doublet chemotherapy. Uh, while we do know that response rates are in the range of 30 to 40%, and the expected PFS is about five to six months. Uh, with the standard platinum-based doublet, the survival still remains dismal around a year. And we do know that in the elderly population and for someone at her age, at 76, uh, uh, this would have been associated with a lot of toxicities and the treatment would have been purely palliative. Next slide, please. Now, uh, we've had a lot of studies with a lot of different immunotherapy drugs where the addition of immunotherapy to chemotherapy has led to improvement in outcomes. Uh, overall survival has been reported as improved progression-free survival when immunotherapy has been added to chemotherapy has been improved. And uh, this slide is one such example, uh, uh, combining pembrolizumab, is, which is one of the immunotherapeutic drugs that has been available in India for quite some time. Uh, uh, you know, clearly uh, adding benefit when added to chemotherapy and particularly in a biomarker identified population or PDL one more than 1%. Next slide. But uh, uh, what about immunomonotherapy? And at 76, even 
immunochemo combination would have been difficult. Uh, so this she did have PDL one, which was more than 50 percent. And uh, does it work? And uh, next slide, Nitish. So uh, this is uh, this. These are the findings from the Keynote 024, which looked at first line immunomonotherapy pembrolizumab uh, compared with the chemotherapy. And as you can clearly see, uh, uh, not only was the median progression-free survival improved uh, with immunomonotherapy pembrolizumab versus chemotherapy, as was overall survival. And I think this is this is a dramatic improvement. You look at chemotherapy and a median overall survival of about 14 months. And with Pembro monotherapy, the median overall survival that was reported was 30 months. And that, that is nearly similar to the kind of survival that we talk about for a patient with lung cancer who uh, harbors a driver mutation. So clearly a significant advantage. And we chose to apply this to our patient. Next slide. So she ended up receiving pembrolizumab as a monotherapy. She did have a few issues, a little bit of fatigue. Uh, the, the TSH went high and we do know that a hypothyroidism is one of the side effects that was easily corrected. And after, so in fact, after uh, just three to four cycles, she had an excellent response. We also gave her bisphosphonates for the bone meds. And uh, at one year, she continues to be on pembrolizumab as monotherapy. Uh, the scan on the right of the picture is the scan post immunotherapy and the left on the picture is the uh, the the pre-immunotherapy scan. So dramatic advantage, improvement in quality of life, minimal side effects. And I think, I think I'm very hopeful that she will replicate the results of uh, median overs of 30 months that we see from, uh, from the trial. Next slide. So I, I think it's safe to conclude that uh, with the addition of immunotherapy, there has, be, has been a significant advance for our patients, especially the ones who do not harbor a target which can be uh, drugged. Immunochemotherapy, is, is a preferred option for a significant number of first line patients. And for those who do not have a target and have a PDL one greater than 50% immunotherapy as a monotherapy now offers the option of a chemo free treatment for these patients. Uh, and a significant number of these patients are actually doing very well. Uh, and we do have uh, experience regards that as well from our clinical practice. And, and uh, it's, it's probably uh, reasonable to say that immunotherapy as a single agent is much better tolerated as compared to conventional chemotherapy. Thank you. Ex excellent. I think that's such an eloquent, eloquent talk, uh, Devrat, uh, as always. I think the, the uh, interesting bit, um, if I may add, is actually the tail here. Uh, if you notice that the graph has not reached in the confidence interval, both PFS and OS, which means there is a small group of these patients which just go on doing well year after year after year after year. So I think that was one of the most startling things why the world went crazy. And in fact, I was asked this about a, a, a newspaper once and I said, in the lifetime of people who become oncologists, Dr. Behra is a perfect example uh, from where they started lung oncology, seeing patients die day after day after day to see the majority live uh, for a couple of years and some actually live beyond five years, half a decade is, is nothing short of a miracle. And I think the case you presented is exactly that. No chemotherapy, 75, disease-free at one year. It's fantastic. Uh, thank you. But uh, I think the other thing that is changing that is, is, the, um, is the targeted therapy. And the question is, can we actually cross a 10-year without chemotherapy in a stage four lung cancer. Uh, uh, quick patient example, 56 years female, normotensive, no cough, uh, complained of some cough and breathlessness of three months only, um, diagnosed uh, uh, with a wide right upper lobe adenocarcinoma, opposite lung, liver, bone, with asymptomatic brain meds. She was EGF and ALK negative at that point. And when you thought about the options at diagnosis, we were mainly thinking of chemotherapy and we did start on that, but we ended up doing NGS for this patient and that showed something. Now, just to brief you what NGS is, it's an extraction of DNA and you run the whole exome, whole abnormal exome of about 300, 500 target genes and look for abnormalities. Now, when you do that, it's not only easier and, and fairly fast now, it can be come back under three weeks, but also you look for those rare mutations, which when you add to the 20, 30% of EGFR or 20 or 8% or of AL, 
the 11223% of the BRAP, the MET, the ROS, and actually now you're seeing some other new targets as well at another 10%. So you're shifting from where only 30% patient could get a non-chemotherapy targeted therapy to a, a patient who could get non-chemotherapy immunotherapy, and now a bigger chunk of patients who are getting non-chemotherapy target therapy. But that's because the NGS is able to look at the entire spectrum together. And I think that's a huge change in how we look for these abnormalities. So this patient had a ROS1 mutation, which is a mutation we've seen less than 1% patients. We're now thinking in Indian population, maybe about one to one and a half percent, but seen less than one patient, mostly found by technology with NGS and sometimes by fish. And these patients standard of care is crizotinib. This patient started on crizotinib and at 18 months later, uh, doing extremely well, no problems. In fact, traveled to the world, um, to Europe and back to the family, said I had slight headache. It possibly was just me coming back from my trip. Um, and I didn't feel very well, but we have a very high index of suspicion for brain disease because she already had asymptomatic brain bedside diagnosis. And we found seven new lesions. She initially had some SRI, so we had obliterated her lesions in the brain. And, and Charu will show you an example of that in the next slide. So we had an MRI in between, which had no new, new disease, no, no disease in the brain. And this time around, we had seen seven new lesions compared to six months ago when the scan was clear on crizotinib. So we did the SRS to, to these lesions. The largest was 1.2 centimeters. The rest was sub-centimeter. This was 18 months later. And the pet showed no disease. And post-SRS, we started our own second-line therapy. These are just uh, four cases that I could quickly pull out of ROS1 mutation. This is the rare mutation. Many centers uh, who don't running NGS or FISH actually have neither. We had four in the last two, uh, in the last couple of years. Uh, the average is, as you see, is a young patient or uh, predominantly should be female or ours were equally divided. And they were good performance status patients. Um, most of them have crossed one year mark. Uh, three of them have actually crossed one and a half year marks and one actually is still on it on crizotinib. But this patient went on serotonib and, and actually continued to be on it for 30 months um, and actually uh, started on serotonib. But the best part is that that uh, the initial diagnosis of 2012, this change on serotonin of 2015, so we are already eight years into, into uh, the drug. I very vividly remember 2012 when we did not know about these drugs. Uh, we did not know about the mutation. So when I got the mutation in his hand, this patient, we spoke to a group in MD Anderson. We are fairly well connected. The patient actually went there uh, for the uh, for a consult, bought crizotinib with them. We did not have the drug in India at that point and continued to have that till the drug became available in India. And then the drug became freely available in India and, and, and uh, then went on compassionate use before she moved on to serotonin. But this was 2012, 2015. We already hit eight years. And I am hoping, because this patient is extremely well, that we will hit 10 years. So the question is, can we hit 10 years or not? So this is a brief of what has happened in lung cancer. I think this becomes a redundant slide after Dr. Behra's absolutely brilliant talk. But I think we clearly see the, the evolution of disease therapies, but you're actually also seeing the evolution of the number of people who are surviving beyond one year. And that's what really is this graph about. It is a bar chart of the number of survivors we are seeing now close to 70% patients who are living beyond one year. And I think it won't be, be the futuristic would be possibly most of them will live beyond one year. So with that, and a very critical part of how the patient managed to live year on year and add decades is, is how we manage the brain. Because we do know lung cancer and brain meds go hand in hand. And early treatment is clearly uh, saving lives in these patients. Uh, over to Charu. But the, the, the question to her, which I put was, can you fix a patient's brain metastasis? The most dreaded sounding thing about cancer in the world, that the cancer has gone to the brain, can it be fixed in one day? Charu? Yeah. yeah, so I mean, it's always Nitesh, our medical oncologist, you know, 
who push us around the corner. So, I mean, I'll call the patient on Monday and we want the patient to be going back on Monday evening. So this is a case <laughs> scenario which she presents to us and it is okay, fine, you call the patient. So uh, I'm just going to uh, directly go to a case. So this is a female patient who is a ruler of Agra and uh, resident of Agra, sorry. She's a 64 year old female and she is diabetic and hypertensive. Next slide. And uh, in April, 2016, she was investigated for a right lower lobe mass. And after clinical examination, biopsy confirmation and complete metastatic workup, she was staged at 3A, adenocarcinoma, and she received new adjuvant chemotherapy followed by surgery. And then she was uh, on follow-up. Uh, then in, now in April 2020, this year, she presented with seizures. So in MRI, you can appreciate that there is a ring enhancing lesion in the left parietal lobe. And the rest of the uh, PET CT was normal. There was no disease anywhere else in the body. So we have got two options generally, either we can do a whole brain radiation or we can go ahead and do SRS. So here you can see, I mean, the whole brain radiation is uh, irritating the whole brain. And uh, treating SRS, it, it can be with a, you know, X knife, that is what we do on LINAC, or it can be a gamma knife or a cyber knife, which is a very high precision radiotherapy. And we know that it will prevent the side effects of whole brain radiation. It is a single day procedure and it does not delay the system in therapy. Next. Next. So here you can see that uh, uh, we make a cast of that patient. Then we have to delineate our, uh, the gross tumor. You can see the one in yellow is the motor cortex, which we have to delineate because that is a, a dose limiting structure. Next. So here you can see how precise we go. So that is the 100% isodose line. That means we had given 20 grain a single fraction to that patient. So on the left, you can appreciate that is the 100% isodose. And if you see the 50% isodose on the left, you can see how little the spillage is. So that is what, you know, this serotactic radiation can do. And the MRI of uh, July 2020 shows a marked regression of the lesion. So, and these are all the sites where, you know, SBRT can easily be done, brain, spine, lung, liver, adrenals, lymph nodes, and bones, which we know are all metastatic sites for cancer lung. Thank you. Excellent. Um, uh, Chadu, again, I always get mesmerized. Uh, I do push, but I also get mesmerized by the fact that we are able to deliver. This patient obviously came very distraught coming from Agra. They had a fit and, and they just wanted a solution. It was COVID times uh, and, and I was very glad when they went back smiling that we managed to deliver all in a day. Uh, this has been wonderful. We tried to keep it to time. We have seven minutes over. Uh, we are very well known that we are very precise, sharp and we finish in time just like we work at, at the hospital. So I'll pass over to Dr. Suryakant and Dr. Harit for Q&As. Um, and, and take it from there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Surikan. Back to Dr. Baran. Dr. Hadith, please. Dr. Surikan, all yours for the Q&A. If we have some questions, we'd love to have them. Yeah. Aaron, you can post the questions on the chat itself. So we have about 30 participants on Facebook. Uh, and we have another 15 years, so we have 45 of us. Uh, so, are there any questions? Can I ask one to Dr. Behra? Dr. Behra? Yes, sir. So, so, really, what was it like, sir, 20 years ago in the lung cancer clinic? <laughs> See, uh, you know, it was very, uh, I should say, it was very. Frustrating experience. Uh, the questions mm -hmm. are being posted on the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Arun. Okay. G, G, Dr. Mehra. So, uh, you know, at that time, for any cancer, it used to be everywhere, give them a course of radiotherapy, depending upon your load, whether it is a single fraction or maybe they're giving full dose. So, what do you mean? PGI in particular, it was the radiotherapy department, which was yeah, looking yeah. after all types of cancer, you know. So they do the chemo also, they were doing radiotherapy. So the workload was too much. So that is the reason why we picked up, uh, we thought let us have the lung cancer. Uh, 
but his friend uh, is now well and alive 4 years later so it stuns him that what he used to think was a two month disease for he says as a physician lung cancer stage pucho na pucho two months that's it yeah. is is a uh, four years in a 75 year old man is actually a miracle of science on a simple uh, but, line i will like to give an anecdote nitesh one dr mathur he he actually says that please go out and tell everybody in public from kota he calls me every year on 6th of june because on 6th of june in 2010 i did is esophagectomy and he said doctor sir all my life i told people cancer esophagus lung nothing more possible just stay at home and i am fine see so he in a way felt very guilty that things have changed i never realized things have changed so much and so i think all of us need to really engage continuously and i take the responsibility as an oncologist that we and dr behra and dr sudekan the pulmonologist we as a leadership community have to really percolate this down to everybody every gp every person should know that how things are changing how it is possible to bring that knowledge to every person in the society yeah any question i think two couple of questions have come in i think one of the question that has come is about aml so i'll i'll ask uh, oren to connect with this patient because we have a very specialized uh, hematology oncology setup it's it's one of the best in the country i feel and we'll we'll connect both of them to yogesh pande who's asked this question but other than that sir please take over sir dr suryakant make sure that this person reaches the right place and uh, Jee, doctor नितेश अरे डॉक्टर डॉक्टर राहुल राहुल जी 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 सर 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 क्वेश्चन व्हाई डू डू वी डोंट सी लंग कैंसर्स इन इंडिया सो सो माय क्वेश्चन इज़ बेसिकली फ्रॉम डॉक्टर ही इज़ द एंड ही इज़ द पर्सन इट ऑल कंपेयरिंग द ग्लोबल डेटा आई वाज़ जस्ट क्यूरियस इट इट इफ़ इज़ लीडिंग or is it actually that we are somehow immune to lung cancers why that aap you see the uh, i think it is a uh, you are very rightly asked this question but still you see lung cancer is still the second uh, commonest cancer in males in india but when you compare to uh for you know other countries but again i will let i will also tell you if you see the cases if you see the reports from the atlas program cancer atlas program of icmr you see the north eastern region they are almost same as that of in case of uh, you know in the usa or the other european countries and if you see the kashmiri data in fact that way so they are uh, if you see population wise they are quite high but in other areas maybe i should say the smoking habit maybe one thing to do it maybe we are not uh, taking that uh, much of heavy smoking that may be only one thing i can say so is it possible that we are still struggling of differentiating lung cancers from tuberculosis even till date that it's probably not getting reported as much frequently that no, I, think, i think by somehow or other as i told you because of now everybody is so aggressively looking the facilities are available everywhere but you are very right earlier days we are missing them as it were closely that was i think initial for many years that was the thing everywhere we are seeing patients before they come to before you diagnose him am lung cancer he will have at least two or three months of anti tb treatment but now with the availability of uh, you know the the tb control program everywhere is put on examination you know some our other the thinking goes that it may not be tb then there the ct scan is now very commonly done so i think many things have changed so therefore things are being picked up but you are right that in earlier days we are missing lot of uh, lung cancer patients patients and they are treated as pulmonary tb thank you sir yeah dr sudhakant what do you think uh, this how it is changing in uh, your practice in up 
and actually, Lucknow, for example, actually see, in Uttar Pradesh, the King George Medical University is the only institution where Department of Respiratory Medicine is practicing the diagnosis and treatment of lung cancer, number one. So you can see the 23 crore population, there is only one medical college. Uh, the respiratory department is taking care of these patients. Uh, fortunately, uh, or unfortunately, you can say we are diagnosing more than 500 cases of lung cancer per year. But the problem is, as Dr. Behra has mentioned, that more than 50% cases, they are actually in not in condition to have any treatment. They just make, we are just making the diagnosis, declaring them, and they are going back to their home. The another problem is that, as Dr. Behra mentioned, more than 80% of them, they have taken anti-tubercular treatment for more than six months. So that in the last two years, what is happening, we are more focusing on molecular diagnosis of pulmonary tuberculosis. And now there is an early diagnosis of pulmonary tuberculosis. And usually the misdiagnosis of pulmonary tuberculosis is going down. And probably now, day by day, we will have more early diagnosis of lung cancer. And Dr. Harit I, uh, and, and Dr. Shubham and Dr. Rodgi, I would request you that please organize more and more program with the chest physicians so yeah, that absolutely. we can sensitize our fraternity for the involvement in the diagnosis of lung cancer, early diagnosis, absolutely. I would say. And then only we can create the early diagnosis, the real data in this country, because the smokers are uh, too many in this country. A lot of smokers are there, especially the BD smoker in Northeast and of course, the, uh, the uh, hilly areas of the country. So we have to, of course, make awareness, not only in the society, but in our fraternity also to improve the, of course, the uh, epidemiological data of, and of course, early uh, diagnosis of lung cancer. And then only we can have the good data and good kind of practice of diagnosis and treatment of lung cancer. And of course, even better outcome also. On this public platform, I will say that our team is ready to do a campaign. Yeah, yeah. So we will take the help of yours. Uh, in future also. One year, let us make sure every nook and corner of UP we have reached out and everybody is aware of the roadmap. Yes. Can we take another question now? Is that uh, question so I think there's a disconnect between uh, between Facebook and here. But um, if there is no question, then of course we can uh, uh, close the program. I I think we can. Sure. So, but we will connect uh, again, Dr. Surya Kant, as you said, sure. we, we have sure. some very interesting ideas in mind. I know Vivek is uh, connected as well. And Vivek is a link between here and Lucknow. So yes, Vivek, uh, we have a job for you in hand. This has been a very, very nice uh, meeting. So Dr. Harith, <laughs> so for you. Yes, for I, think, I think before Dr. Harith said, I must compliment the Mark group, I think it is, I should say, they have seen a very unique program that way, you know, within a very short time, you gave example. This is the best way of for teaching and bringing, bringing awareness. Everything was covered in a very nice manner, I should say. I was rather than making, giving lectures. You said, so you showed cases, starting from diagnosis to everything, you covered everything. In fact, the immunotherapy, the targeted therapy, the media stenoscopy, how to diagnose, how to assess. I think everything was covered in a very nice way. I actually, I like. I have not seen such a program like this. Let me compliment the team Thank and you, the, Dr. Chaturvedi and his team. So Thank this is much. this is this was actually our day-to-day -day work which we presented. Yeah. We we, nice. we very think nice. like this, so we presented like that. Nice. It is very nice. Uh, Thank, Thank you. you very much for these kind words. Getting such yeah. inspiration from somebody yeah, like you is very very sir. very Thank generous you. and very inspiring. It motivates us to more and more. So thank you very much. Thank Professor you. Surikant, thank you very much for organizing this. We look forward to 100 such meetings in next one year. Yes. Actually, yeah. I'm yeah. telling you yeah. that I mean it. That yeah. We, yeah. we are excited to do it 24-7. I want to make sure that we reach every nook and corner of Uttar Pradesh and whatever is possible, wherever is possible, we should go out and make sure that we connect that and make it possible. So with thank that, you, thank you, Dr. Chaturvedi. Thank you for your whole team. You have wonderful uh, team leader, and uh, your team is very fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I have yeah. seen such a uh, precise presentation from everybody, yeah. from mm -hmm. Shubham Jain, from uh, Madam. Madam Dr. 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 We all, we all, we have a great.
and that is what era is always always wonderful orator to us and uh, you see yesterday also we disturbed dr behra we have a uh, very important meeting yesterday also our national college of chess research in india where dr behra gave his expert opinion he was the invitee or uh, special invitee in that meeting so yesterday also we disturbed around three more than three hours uh, and of course today also today he uh, today before everybody else and he's yeah. just right through this is really really inspiring me mm-hmm. to i i always mean, a pleasure sir i know what it means to sit no, no, sir, in the it. company of uh, so many lalend people it is always actually i learned a lot sir thank you very much thank you thank you sir thank you sir thank you very kind of you sir thank you thank you thank you vivek thank you thank you sir thank you sir thank you very much thank you bye thank you thank you all thank you bye Thanks, Thanks Satesh, for thank organizing you. it. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Really, sir. Thank you. Sir.